But first, I get the feeling that the room is like a little heavy with photographers. I'm curious about that. By a show of hands, how many people identify as photographers? <laughs> OK. I'm assuming the rest of you are, that's like half, but not overwhelming. So I'm assuming the rest of you are like designers and visual people, people who are really interested in. Can you speak louder? Is the mic not on? No, it's not on. OK. I could absolutely speak louder. So, so with all these visual people, um, I want to say it's, it's really a pleasure to show pictures to people who are all about pictures. You're visual people. Um, I've been thinking about how I often say I listen to my pictures. And uh, I think that looking is the visual equivalent of listening. And I think there are some people who listen more carefully than others. Um, but a lot of you are people who see for a living, like me. And I love that the photographer Saul Leiter said that he thought that seeing is an underrated enterprise. Right? So as we talk about um, seeing, I want to start not only showing you pictures, but engaging you guys with each other. The sound in the room up until the time that Frank got up to speak was so beautiful, that sort of ruba, ruba, ruba of everybody talking to each other. So I want to take just a minute and have you turn to somebody you don't know, right? not somebody you already know, and just talk to this person for a minute about what photography is for. What do you think photographs are for? Like, what's the purpose of photographs? What, what do they mean to you? So find somebody you don't know and talk to them just for a minute. <laughs> Okay, that is, such, that is such a beautiful sound. I really I love that, it's so cool. So, so what we're gonna do, first though, it's like, it's like, you know, what do pictures do? I mean, some people say they do the same thing as words, they describe things, they tell stories, they, they help us sort of share our own perspective on things. But I think pictures and words are really different and that's one of the things that I wanna talk about like tonight is the difference between pictures and words and where words hit us and where pictures hit us. So I'm going to do a little show and tell. And I'm thinking back to when we were like little kids in grade school, you do a show and tell, it's like there's show and there's tell, right? So it's like I'm showing you pictures and I'm talking to you, but the words hit a different place than the pictures do. And so I, I want us all to notice that I want to show you something is really different than I want to tell you something. And I think we're going to talk a little bit later about sort of the language of photography uh, and the difference between these two languages. Um, so Cartier-Bresson, uh, our friend, our, our favorite, right? Cartier-Bresson said in a late interview as an old man when he was cranky and he was painting and he wasn't photographing anymore, he said, comma, God damn it, I'm not interested in photography. I'm interested in geometry and emotion, right? And so what I want to do is I want to share with you guys what I'm interested in. So I'm obviously interested in places, but I'm also really interested in play. I'm interested in playing. Uh, I realize like I don't do a lot of playing in my life. Friends, printing stuff, it's all really, really cool and really fun. 
this, and I'm going to talk later about the title of the talk, Trusting the Process. I'm interested in transformation. I'm interested in perception. Mostly, I'm interested in stuff that's bigger than us, that we're part of, right? And I don't mean that literally. I mean it more metaphorically. Um, what I'm also interested in is um, seeing the unseen. And I think most of the things that are really important to us, we can't see. We can't see feelings. We can't see the huge part of the electromagnetic spectrum that's outside the range of visible light. And there's like all these invisible things happening all the time. You know, TV, radio waves, Wi-Fi is all around us and we can't see it, but it's transmitting all this stuff. And I think there are lots of things that we're receiving all the time that we're not even aware of. And I try to put these things in front of me by making pictures. Uh, making pictures for me is a way of seeing what I'm interested in and what I'm receiving and what I'm about and where I'm going. And so it's a form of self-divination. I make lots of pictures and then patterns emerge and I figure out what's going on and I love that. Uh, also, it's really playful, it's playtime. Um, Ansel Adams said, I'm interested in expressing something which is built up from within rather than that which is extracted from without. And people tend to think photography is what, what's about out there, but I'm going to argue that everything we perceive is created in here, in here, in here, and it's not about what's out there. Um, so I'm interested in all these things, and I'm also really interested in talking with you guys. I'm very conscious that that beautiful sound we had in the room is like still, and I'm the one talking. But I hope we can continue this conversation when we do the Q&A. And if you have a burning question while I'm showing you pictures, that would be great. You know, let's talk about stuff. So the pictures I'm showing you now are um, pictures I made in Iceland. And it's a really elemental place. And what Shari said is true. But what's also true is I don't want you to know which of my pictures aren't real and which ones are real. Um, some of them are and some of them aren't. You know, it's like I'm really interested in what you're projecting onto the pictures and what you think reality is and what you think photography is. So, you know, in the little teaser for this whole event, I said my pictures are not about what you might call consensus reality. In fact, I'm much more interested in photography's ability to interpret and transform the world than to record it. I'm fascinated by the persistent myth that the camera never lies and by this question like, what is reality anyway, and do we have a hand in creating it? So as I said, I'm interested in perception, and I'm interested in how sensation and perception are different. Right? Sensation is me having light pass through my eyeball and hit my optic nerve. But perception is about what happens when that light hits the optic nerve and turns into biochemistry that goes along my neurons into a part in my brain where like red, green, and blue, two upside down, backwards images, edges, um, experience, all come together to reassemble what's coming through my eyes into something that I think I'm seeing. And what we see comes from more inside than outside, according to the perception science. More than 50% of what we think we see, we're seeing because we're scanning and we expect to see it. Um, so. I'm really curious about how we create our own reality all the time, not just in seeing, but in how we think about things and what we think about people and what we, um, what we expect to see. So what we choose to focus on, right, that creates our reality. That's a little photography joke. Um, you know, just like this title of Trust the Process, my wife just pointed out, it's like a photography joke, like process, like we're processing. I never got that before. That's hilarious. So, so on these quotes, right, this, this sheet that's laying around, and I hope you all take one, uh, there's a quote from Jerry Yulesman, who I'm a huge fan of. And what he says is, the word we use in our culture when referring to the act of photographing is taken. Photographs are taken. Viewers then take them for the truth. So that's all about your perception and your projection. And this series, I love that, Frank, I love this is called projections. I mean, like, the double entendre on the fact that we're using a projector, but we're all creating our reality all the time because we're projecting onto the world. That really, really works for me. Um, apparently, there are an estimated 7.7 .7 billion p 
people on the planet. I looked it up this morning. <laughs> uh, so what I think that means is that there are 7.7 .7 distinct and unique realities. Now, I know some of you believe me, and some of you are like, no, that's not true. But speaking as somebody who's been together with my wife, who's here for 25 years, like, I could tell you we've often had the experience of two people being in the same place at the same time and having completely different experiences. So I love that photography is this metaphor for how we create our own reality, because we all process differently. You know, sometimes I put pictures together to make a new picture, but Either way, what's happening is that what comes into the camera gets interpreted. I mean, we're all doing processing all the time, whether it's in Lightroom or whether it's in our heads. So I'm really interested in photography as a process, right? I don't know how things are going to turn out. Even when I was doing a lot of commercial work, you know, you take a skill set and you put it to work on solving problems that have parameters. But you don't ever know exactly what it's going to look like at the end of the day. You have to trust this process that you're engaged in, and you have a skill set, right? But each one of us sees things differently. I mean, I, I lead a lot of workshops, and I've often had the experience of being in the field with 15 or 20 people. And you come back to the lab and look at the pictures on a computer, and they're totally different. I mean, even people who are standing next to each other with the same lens and the same gear, they're taking different pictures. So, I'm really interested in that, and I titled this talk, Trust the Process, right? Because I really do believe that I trust the process. I've been, I've been going to a retreat center in the Catskills for about 30 years now, and it's not religious, there's no guru, there's no belief structure I need to buy into. I just think of it as a place to get unstuck and to see things differently. And one of the basic tenets of this place is this quote, trust the process. That's with a capital T and a capital P. Um, what that means to me, though, is that I don't need to trust you. I don't need to trust the teacher. I don't need to trust myself. I need to just engage in sort of jumping off this cliff into this process of making pictures or finding out about myself or even just processing a picture from a raw file to a finished print, right? And what happens is as I listen to the pictures, as I engage with those pictures, they talk to me. And I try to listen to them. And the better I listen to them, the better the result is. And the process doesn't always work. I mean, I've been down like a 1,000 dead-end roads, but that's part of the process, too. You keep doing it until something emerges that you couldn't have imagined. And it's the part about, you know, I wonder what's going to happen now, that's the best part. That's the fun. That's the playtime. It's like, what could possibly happen? You've got a camera. You've got a car. You've got infinite potential, like anything could happen. The, the next picture that you take is gonna be the best one you ever made. That's why we keep doing it. It's like people who are obsessed with golf. You know, it's like, I'm gonna get that hole in one someday. <laughs> so I'm really curious what my own pictures are gonna teach me. And as Shari said, like, like my process is like not necessarily super straightforward. I think of myself kind of as a stepchild of Ansel Adams and Jerry Yulesman. <laughs> in the sense that, that Ansel Adams was all about pre-visualization, right? He wanted to, to visualize the finished print in his mind before he hit the shutter. Uh, Jerry Yulesman's a little different. He would wander around and he'd shoot and shoot and shoot and then he'd sit with the contact sheets and say, oh, that one kind of goes with that one, right? And I like to do both those things. Those are really, really fun for me. Um, I also like to think of my lineage as having sort of these spiritual grandfathers. I wish there were more women. I could sort of look to in this, but the history is kind of skewed. But, you know, my spiritual grandfathers are absolutely Gustave Le Gray and Henry Peach Robinson, who were making composite images in the 1860s. If you guys think Photoshop is new, you got another thing coming, and you should get the catalog for uh, faking it, the, the, the exhibition from four or five years ago that Mia Feynman created at the Met that showed decade by decade that there was far, far more photo illustration than straight photography right from 1839 on. Straight photography is an invention of the 20th century, you know, from Life magazine and from my buddy Ansel Adams and the F64 school. But my friend Dan Burkholder likes to say to people who think that photography is about reality, he says, it's not called reality, god damn it. It's called <laughs> photography, right? So I'm a photographer, and, and what I'm interested in 
is I'm interested in using the camera as what Minor White called a metamorphosing machine. Uh, I, I really love that there's this ability to take the raw material of the world and be aware of the fact that I'm going to distort it and then distort it the way that I want to distort it instead of just assuming that things are supposed to look like they look. Um, Minor White also talked about photographing. He said, he said, the camera is great for photographing things as they are. But he also said he discovered that the camera is wonderful for photographing things for what else they are. And I'm really, really interested in what else things are. So this little series of random pictures is just a bunch of stuff that um, I really like that isn't necessarily a body of work, but they're pictures I wanted to show you. And I wanted to talk to you while I show them about how the way I put pictures together parallels the way that I think we all see. Uh, you know, again, with that perception science, when people are in a car crash, what, what the, the responding policeman often hears is they came out of nowhere. The reason that someone didn't see what they crashed into is because there's only a little tiny section of our eye that's high resolution. And most of it is like, like, like two megapixels. It's crap. But we're scanning all the time. And we're assembling a panorama in our head all the time. And so the reason that we didn't see the thing we crashed into is because I was actually scanning over here, but I thought I was looking at this. And we're doing that constantly as we assemble this reality in our visual cortex. So for me to want to do the assembly out in front of me, right, just seems like a natural step. Um, I wanted to share a little more about what Shari was saying about you know, Karen and Richard and me. I never met Richard before. I love his work. Uh, Karen brought us together thanks to Grayson and to you, Shari, and Frank. And it's like there's this beautiful synchronicity. So, so Richard and I met on Skype a few weeks ago. And Karen and Richard and I had this great conversation and realized that you know, Karen's <coughs> intuition was spot on, that even though our work looks really, really different, the three of us, we're really interested in a lot of the same things. And I think one of the things that all three of us is interested in is transformation. Photography is a tool for transformation, right? Not for recording, not for accuracy. I think accuracy is so hard. It's so much easier to just interpret. But in this conversation, Richard pointed me to a couple of things that Gary Winogrand said, and he gave me the OK to share them with you. So, one thing that, that Winogrand said apparently is, photography is not about the thing photographed. It is about how that thing looks photographed. I really like that. He also said, and I love this, he said the photograph should be more interesting or more beautiful than what was photographed. Again, it's transformation. And this is a guy who we think of as you know, the godfather of sort of reality, street photography. But but he and Ansel Adams and all these straight photographers were really very, very much into the idea of using the camera uh, as an interpretive device, as a, as a metamorphosing machine. Now, I think that, as I mentioned before, there's a big difference between show and tell. And so photography is a language of its own. And I love the fact that when I make pictures, the part of my brain that uses words goes offline. right? And hopefully, when you're looking at my pictures, it's conveying something to you that I sort of needed to get from out here to in front of me. But I don't even know what that is. Like, I keep making these pictures, and I know there's something in them. I mean, the ones that I'm showing you, um, I know have a feeling. There's, there's something in them that's strong, that's like balanced, that really works. And I think somehow in you looking at these pictures that you get something and it takes you somewhere. Now, I don't think it takes you to this actual place in Norway. Oh, I don't think it takes you to this actual place in Norway where I made the picture. But I'm really interested in places as metaphorical places. Um, so like I said, Ansel Adams, um, straight photographer that he was, said, I can't verbalize on the internal meaning of pictures whatsoever. Some of my friends can at very mystical levels. I prefer to say that if I feel something strongly, I would make a photograph that would be the equivalent of what I felt. When I'm ready to make a photograph, I think I quite obviously see in my mind's eye 
something that is not literally there in the true meaning of the word. I'm interested in expressing something which is built up from within rather than that which is extracted from without. And we were just in Yosemite a couple months ago. It's like, you, you drive through the valley in Yosemite, it's like Ansel Adams was such a liar. Oh my God, it's so cool. Um, I also just, on this riff of, of photography as a different language, uh, I went to a talk that Greg Heisler gave a few years ago, and he talked a lot about what he calls the narrative code of light, which I just think is a beautiful phrase. It's this idea that, that this is this other language that we all speak and we all understand, and some of us engage in you know, creating in this language as if we were authors. Now, if I were an author, I would not be a nonfiction writer. I would be like Isabel Allende. I'd be like a magical realist. I mean, so, so I think it's cool that in writing, nobody yells at people for the genre that they write in, but oftentimes when people find out my pictures aren't real, like Shari did, they're really mad. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's really funny how um, my German cousin, for example, when she found out my images were composites, she didn't talk to me for like a month. She thought I was like, you're such a liar. I thought this was so funny. So this last body of work that I want to show you guys is just a teaser. There's an exhibition that I have right now on a boat on Pier 25, uh, which is just north of Stuyvesant High School on the west side of Manhattan. And the boat is part of a community of maritime restoration in New York. There are a lot of old work boats like this boat, the, the fireboat J.J. Harvey, that were supposed to be retired and scrapped years and years ago. And these, these boats are kept alive by very, very passionate uh, preservationists who put money and time and love into these machines. Um, and this is about as close as you'll get from me to documentary. But for me, what grew out of finding abandoned industrial sites when I was out photographing the landscape has become like a whole other way of relating to photography for me. Um, I think that, that the places that I found, uh, like this old limestone mill in Norway, these, these abandoned spaces are like cathedrals. There's something really beautiful about them. But also, the love that went into making you know, this hand-painted uh, hand DC voltmeter, or you know, that, that went into the design of this massive, massive crane hook. I mean, you see that chain here and you can see the scale. The chain is tiny and the hook is huge. So I started photographing a lot of abandoned industrial sites and right now the exhibition that's up on the lilac is all prints of New York City like maritime heritage and this stuff is disappearing all the time but what I love about this work is that it suggests to me not only the passage of time and the love that went into the creation of all of these things and all of the functionality of these machines. Um, the fireboat J.J. Harvey, for example, was supposed to be long scrapped when 9-11 happened. And it was able to evacuate literally like hundreds of people to New Jersey and then stayed on site and put out fires for days because there was no ability to use fire hydrants downtown. You know, like, there's a life to these machines, and sometimes when their life gets extended, magical things happen. But for me, what I want to close with in talking to you is that none of this, right, this industrial stuff, would be possible if we weren't standing on the shoulders of thousands of giants, people who figured out metallurgy, people who figured out hydrography, how to make a boat float, how to set up a bunch of pistons so that it would drive a propeller shaft, how to make those things. And that's true of photography also. Like, I couldn't make a Nikon D850 even if I did not know the optics and the metallurgy and all the stuff that was required. So my point is that there are things that we can only do together, cooperatively, generationally, intergenerationally, and I think it's really important that we realize that we can only do great things when we do them with each other, like this little thing tonight, right? When we begin to recognize that we are all in this together and that nothing would be possible if we weren't co 
cooperating with each other, that's, <laughs> that's what I want to leave you with. The idea that, that if we want to make photographs, if we want to play, if we want to do great things, if we want to have projectors and LEDs and like food, what we need to do is we need to be kind to each other. We need to be gentle with each other. We need to be considerate of each other. And as a bunch of photographers, we need to see each other. All right, I think that's it.